Hello everyone, Clack of the Geek here. Now before we get into this podcast, I would just like to say I am this close to 200 subscribers and I've got a very special video planned. So if you're not already subscribed, do us a favour and subscribe and I would love you forever. Anyway, on to the video. Hello everyone, Clack of the Geek here and welcome back to the Doctor Who Series 1 Review Podcast. Now, unfortunately, Ronnie's been quite busy so he's not on this one, unfortunately. So it's just me this week you know it's, it's a shame but hopefully hopefully he'll be back for the future for the uh, the next episodes anyway we are uh, today i'm going to be reviewing doctor who series one episode seven the long game i mean it is quite weird of you know having me and ronnie you know not having our like banter at the beginning and we're chatting about haircuts and uh, boris johnson having stained stupid things i mean he says that all the time anyway anyway uh t- anyway uh, yeah it's, yeah that's weird isn't it but anyway, today, let's review this episode. So this is the seventh episode of series one, and often seen as the worst of the series, and like the worst Eccleston story. Do I agree with that? Well, let's find out. So let's start off with the Doctor, Christopher Eccleston. Now, I, I mean, I don't know. I, his performance is definitely very good, but I don't know. This isn't uh, as memorable, in my opinion. And I don't I mean, okay, his performance is fantastic, but I don't know. Maybe it's more down to the script, but... I don't really feel he has a lot of memorable moments in this story. Like he has some good, he has some good witty one-liners and a, a, a very good rapport with Simon Pegg. But I don't think the script allows him to do an awful lot, and so I just feel that this is the only story in series one that I find out that I find is, in terms of the Doctor, fairly forgettable. And the same can be kind of said for Rose. I feel like it just sort of. Yeah, I don't really... There's not an awful lot that I can remember. Which is odd, because even in the other stories that I've talked about with Ronnie, you know, Rose, you know, there's a turn of the earth speech and the uh, his introduction scene. End of the world, there's him dancing to Tainted Love and also the last of the Time Lords bit. Unquite Dead, him fanboying over Charles Dickens. Uh, the Slovenes who parted, there's some really funny quotes like, Do you mind not farting while I'm trying to save the world? Dalek, I mean, it, that speaks for itself of all the scenes of the his interactions with the Dalek, but this one, I don't know. And I think the same could be said for Rose. I don't really feel that she contributes an awful lot to this story. I don't, I don't know. It just, I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's odd, but it's not down to the performances. The performances are great, but yeah, the script doesn't really allow them to do an awful lot. And in terms of companions, you've also got Adam, and he's quite prominent in this story. And we're not going to talk about the actor, but you know, we, I don't like Adam at all as a character. I don't like him at all. He's just pointless, he's annoying, he's unlikable. And in Dalek, I could kind of overlook it because he wasn't a very prominent part of the story. But here, he's kind of the focus and it's just, he's just not, I don't like him. I really don't. And because he takes up so much screen time. Uh, yeah. And I mean, the idea of a failed companion could be quite interesting, but like it, it's not executed properly, in my opinion. Now let's move on to the villains. So you've got two villains. You've got Simon Pegg as the editor, and you've also got the Jagrafest, the the mighty Jagrafest, the holy hadrogesic Max Rodenfo. How I managed to remember that, I don't know. Anyway, so you've got Simon Pegg as the editor, who I think is really good. Like it, Simon Pegg really does elevate the story, and his, the, his character, he really elevates it as the editor. He's really... Yeah, he's very witty, very, you know, got a, a good screen presence, and he's just a really interesting, quite cool villain. On the flip side, however, the Jagrafess is he's just a rubbish monster. It doesn't do anything, really. Just a, He just goes, rah, and it's just... like Honestly, the, the Jagrafess is so unnecessary, and it just really detracts from the story. And this is what I hate about certain, like, stories, is you have a very interesting villain. In this case, it's the editor... You know, very, you know, yeah, yeah, just an interesting villain that he's quite, you quite like as a character. And then they introduce another villain who's meant to be higher on the food chain, but not nearly as interesting. So not only is that a a pants villain, but the one that you liked is on the cook. So it's like, it's a lose-lose situation. And I don't, I do honestly think that Doctor Who doesn't need a monster of the week every single week. If it's not a very good monster, then why have it? You know, have the editor. I think he works really well. But the Jagrafest, you don't need a big a big monster of the week. It's just, you know. I mean, Torture, the Doctor Who spin-off, um, did a few stories where 
there weren't really any monsters. It was just telling interesting, good sci-fi stories. Example, out of time from the first series, it was literally just three people from the 1950s get taken forward to present-day Cardiff, and it's about them adapting to it. It's a really sad story. It's a, it's a, it's absolutely brilliant. And another example, I guess, Fragments, which is from series two, it's sort of they get caught in an explosion, and it just sort of tells their origin stories, like their life flashing before their eyes. You don't, you can tell interesting sci-fi stories without having monsters you know there's more to sci-fi than that and yeah it does it is a bit of a bugbear of mine and it's even more frustrating because when in this actual story there's some great stuff when it comes to like the world building and its political messages so yeah it's got great world building you know the scenes at the beginning like the opening 10 minutes where you get to explore satellite five and all the different stalls and like there's beef flavored slush puppy and like what the fourth great and bountiful human empire is. Why are the names in this are so long? Anyway, but it's great world building and it's the society and, you know, the environment feels really fleshed out and, you know, it, it feels quite futuristic in a way and there's just some really novel ideas and it. I really like it. And the different floors feel really distinct. Obviously, you've got at the beginning, there's, uh, I think it's floor 130 something, nine, I think. I can't remember. But, it's, you know, it's the grimy, you know, market stalls and, you know, that kind of thing. It's really cool. Then we get to floor 500, it's very gloomy and icy and atmospheric and dark and really well, really well directed. And then, like, floor 16, the medical bit, uh, it's, it's, you know, it, all of it feels very distinct and very fleshed out. And I like the world building in this story. And as well as that, the political messages. Now, series one is quite a political series. We talked about this in... The Aliens of London review, but uh, th this story also sort of has some really, you know, sort of big political messages, and it's mainly about fake news and, you know, misinformation. And there's that great scene from the editor, you know, the right word in the right broadcast, it can sh shatter an economy, change a vote, that bit. It's a really good message, and it's probably more relevant now than it was in 2005. I mean, back in 2005, you did have obviously the Iraq war and there was all this like misinformation that there were weapons of mass destruction and it turns out there weren't. So it's not as obvious as the Aliens of London one in terms of that regard, but it's still quite it was still quite timely then and it's even more timely now with fake news being a buzzword that's used every five seconds, you know, and it's people's reliance on the media and, you know, they're not thinking for themselves and it is quite it's quite a dark and quite scary and brutal message, a bit sort of George Orwell, 1984, a little bit in a way, I guess. And then you have the ending with Adam getting chucked out of the TARDIS, who was like a failed companion. As I said earlier, this idea of like a failed companion is interesting on paper, and I think in one of the comics they revisit it or something, like Adam is the villain or something, I don't know. But in execution, because I don't really like Adam, I don't really feel... If it was more likeable and it made him more human like if it made him more likable you might sympathize with him more because it's like oh you, what you've done isn't very good but i see where you're coming from it just yeah i did i did i did i yeah i don't know now just a few little things at uh, the end of this uh, yeah i don't really have much to say about this one but yeah direction you know the visual style of the story very good each area feels very distinct and yeah it was really cool also a, a really odd thing but Cool. As a Friday, as a Friday night dinner fan, as you know, it was really cool seeing Tams and Greg in this story. In in Friday night dinner, she's Jackie, and it's really cool seeing her. She's a very small part. She plays the nurse that gives Adam his little chip in his brain, but um, yeah, it was really cool seeing her. And yeah, those chips are really weird, aren't they? But they don't look a bit, they don't look a bit weird at all. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, that's all of it. Yeah, that's all I really have to say about this story. It's just a bit forgettable. Yeah, I don't really have a lot to say about this one. So overall, I would give it a 6 out of 10. I don't think it's the weakest of Series 1. I'd probably give that to the end of the world. I do slightly prefer this, but I, I don't know. It's just... Th there's some really good stuff in here. Don't get me wrong. Like, Simon Pegg is the editor. Great. World building. Great. The way it sort of links to the finale, you know, Battle of Point of the Ways. Great. Um, The fake news allegories. Great. But... Uh, there's also some not so good stuff like thrown in there, like the Jagrafess or the focus on Adam, and then some of the other stuff that should be good, like Eccleston and Rose and I don't know. It just sort of 
Yeah, it just feels a bit uh, slightly half baked. So yeah, six out of ten for me. So yeah, that's the other video. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, sorry again. Sorry, Ronnie. Co Ronnie couldn't be here. He was, you know, he's been very busy as of late. So I figured I'd give him a little bit of a break, and hopefully he can come back for future episodes of the, you know, of this series one review podcast. And again, I also I apologise that this is a bit of a day. This is a day late. Then it should be. It should have come out yesterday. But yeah, there's been a lot, a load of like technical you know, difficulties and stuff, and honestly, I haven't been as motivated because of this week in the Doctor Who fandom, it's really not been good, I don't know, I, I just haven't been as motivated, but hopefully things can get better, anyway, that's in the video, Um, be sure to like and subscribe, and click the notification bell, what do you think of the episode, if you've seen it, do you like it, do you not, and, uh, and uh, this is Clark of the Geek, uh, signing out, goodbye everyone.